I won't say too much about Daisy's story. It, it's interesting, it's fascinating. Um, and she's obviously here to, to talk to you about that. Um, I'm very, very pleased that she's able to be here today. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Daisy Henson to you. Thank you very much. Um, my story, I'm apologising in advance, is quite complicated and quite long and apparently interesting. Um, so basically to start with, I've been seeing people about my mental health from a very young age and um, none of them have been very helpful until now. And um, I first say I, I saw my GP and we just used to talk and I, I was very ill and very um, quiet and I, I, didn't, I didn't have a life, I was hated at school basically, I was so annoying. I had so many rules that I had to follow that no one wanted to be my friend and um, I was very, very unhappy and then I kind of just sort of stopped talking about it so I assumed everything was fine. Um, I never once got a diagnosis when I was that young. I was kind of, I was always talked about having anxiety and I had panic attacks from a very, very young age and um, I remember sitting in my year three classroom thinking I was going to die but actually what I was doing was having a panic attack and no one knew what to do to help me because they thought, oh, there's something ill, that like you're ill. I got a, a medical diagnosis instead every time I said I didn't feel right. So it just kind of perpetuated any issue that I had. Um, briefly, just say what I've been diagnosed with. Um, <laughs> many things. Um, I've had a diagnosis of general anxiety, severe anxiety, depression, which was wrong, um, and uh, eating disorder. I've had anorexia and OCD and metaphobia. So, quite a few things to have to deal with. Um, I firstly, I went to CAMS when I was, I think, 15, which is the, the child services, and they were shocking. Uh, it, was, it was just awful. I had an emergency appointment because I had kind of collapsed in a heap of anxiety one day and just had given up and I'd stopped eating and everything was just horrendous. And um, when we went in to go and say what was wrong with me, when we said emetophobia, they were like, what's that? Uh, are you sure you're just not you know, hiding something? And actually, I think we're, you're bulimic. I, I got told that I was bulimic quite a lot, and I was like, well, I'm pretty sure I'm not, because I really want to be sick. <laughs> and uh, every time they say that, I get anxious, so they thought maybe I was trying to cover it up or trying to cover up a lie, and actually I was getting anxious because they kept on saying vomit to me. Um, and then uh, I, I, had a, I had a nurse, I had a CBT nurse, and she was lovely, like a lovely woman, but um, bless her, couldn't do anything. And uh, <laughs> she was supposedly, we were supposed to be doing CBT, but um, yeah, I think that I learned how to do ribbon breathing from when I was about six, and so I spent a good few sessions with her when I was older, learning about how to control my breath, and I was like, oh, then I can do this, <laughs> I have learned. And um, it was all about... Um, having to kind of see why I was being anxious. They were actually just, it, it was, they didn't tell me anything I didn't know already. And also the fact that I had to explain what emetophobia was every time I met a new consultant and having them say, well, actually, I don't, I don't really know what that is. We, do, we don't have any specialists. Um, we don't really deal with phobias. And kind of having someone say that the phobia wasn't a problem and that it was actually just anxiety and I focused it on one thing. Um, I had a a shocking, again, psychiatrist with CAMS, who just slapped me on medication, um, gave me, I had fluoxetine, um, which made me depressed, even though um, I wasn't had, taking it for depression, I was supposedly taking it for anxiety, but one time he asked me, why, why did I prescribe you this again? Um, what, what was it for? And I was like, well, for anxiety. And he goes, no, no, it's for depression, because you're suicidal. And I was like, well, I'm suicidal now, because you're not listening to me. Um, and then I, I tried to get on a different drug, then he tried to give me citalopram, then he gave me melatonin for sleep, then I had, um, I think I had, I had promethazine as well. I had just basically any drugs that they could think of. They were like, have it, have it, have it. Um, he also, I'm trying to like curb my language trying to describe this man. <laughs> well, he was a bit of a 
dick. But, um, <laughs> my parents and I have, have had a lot of conversations about him. We, we were going to take action, kind of like legal action for this man, because he misdiagnosed me so many times. And he tried to convince my parents that I had an eating disorder and started telling me all about calories and weight. And they weighed me a lot because I was losing weight from being so terrified of eating. Uh, and then when they finally got me to start gaining weight, I was like, no, I'm not doing this, because I don't want to gain weight anymore. So then the anorexia developed, and I got worse and worse and worse, and I also started lying even more. But the, my, my last anecdote about my shocking psychiatrist was um, one time when I met him, I was on my own, and my parents went in the room, which I apparently shouldn't have happened, and um, he said, okay, can you tell me a list of the foods that you, you know, you're scared of? And so I listed every food under the sun, apart from like, I think it was an orange or something, and, uh, or cucumber, I can't remember. And um, he was like, well, Daisy, let's just, let's just face it, you, you need to eat a potato and just get over it. And I was like, oh, potato's scary, man, no. Um, anyway, that was him, that was my experience with cams, and it's still a sore spot in our house. Um, I was also referred to FEDS, which are the Family Eating Disorder Services, where I used to have these two rather large ladies come and weigh me and tell me to eat some nuts. Um, <laughs> but bless, they were, they were okay, they, they were nice to me. Um, I just used to lie there and be like, yeah, yeah, sure, I want to gain weight, yeah, I love, I love food, like, woo! Um, I had family therapy as well, and that was just me lying to my parents and my therapist saying, like, I just want everyone to be happy, like, I just, I just want everyone to be happy. Me and my mum hadn't talked for about six months, which was not pleasant when I was living in the same house as her and trying to, you know, be a, an A-level student. And um, so I kind of faked my way through that therapy, got myself discharged at a healthy weight, but I was not. I was still incredibly ill. Um, literally about two weeks after I was discharged, I went... <laughs> There's no one watching me anymore. I can go crazy. Um, and I relapsed. I had a huge relapse and um, ended up in crisis. And I was in A&E, um, not eating or drinking, kind of dying. And uh, But I, I didn't really care. And I, I'd do this thing where my parents would try and pick me up to feed me. And I'd just go up, flop. And they couldn't pick me up. So I, I was in, I didn't have any kind of control anymore over my head. I was just like, nah, this is it. I'm just going to die. Um, so I, um, I saw SEDCAS. Um, from my CMHT mental health team and said Cas with a severe eating disorders um, and consultation advisor. Or something, they're called something different now. <coughs> with SEDS. and um, they basically they met me and went, mm, you need to go to hospital. So that then was my first mission to hospital um, at an inpatient ward for eating disorders. Um, I went to Bethlehem Royal Hospital, which I must say, like, is bedlam, like it is actually the bedlam. Um, and I went in and I actually met Claire, who I'm with today, um, and she told me that she hated me when I came because I was so up myself. And I was like, I'm not ill, like, I don't have anorexia, like, what are you, these people are so crazy, oh! And little did I know that that was me. Um, and I, I basically just ate to leave and I refused to gain weight uh, past a, a certain point and I was telling everyone that I was healthy and that everything was fine. And so... I also wasn't participating in my therapy very well because I, I liked my therapist but I was a bit like, well, you can make me do exposure but I'm never going to do it when you're not here. And uh, I had to do lots of horribly things and she, she was lovely, my therapist, and she kind of, I think she kind of knew that I wasn't really trying so I only had a few sessions with her and then they were like, bye. Uh, and I was discharged. Um, back to my CMHT with SEDCAS and I also got a new psychologist who, bless, also didn't know what emetophobia was. Um, and she uh, looked up David Veal, and I actually tried to see David Veal before, but got told that I was too sick and that he couldn't help me, um, and that I should basically just live with being ill for the rest of my life. And um, so she, she looked up lots of things, and we, we spent a good few sessions just talking about the word vomit, and then looking at pictures of cartoons of fake vomit, and then pictures of fake vomit that looked real, and then a picture of a toilet, and then a picture of someone who looked like they could have been sick, and I was like, woman, no! Because <laughs> I, I had really briefly looked at Thrive, but I'd actually been to see Rob, and I kind of was like, yeah, yeah, like, I really want to get better, but I didn't at the time. And um, so I knew that my phobia wasn't about vomit itself, I didn't, act, I wasn't scared of sick, and um, this lady, she did help me, kind of, really finally realised, oh yeah, it's really not about vomit because I can watch that video and not feel gross. And um, so, yeah, she, you know, she helped a bit. 
Um, but I just kind of mucked around with her, and because I was relapsing at the time, I was like, oh, well, my brain's not really working, so don't care. And uh, so then I, I went back to, I was with Sed Castile, and they were lovely, but my nurse just kind of knew that I was pissing about with her. And um, I, I used to go out with my the community worker and we'd have lunch and stuff, but I'd kind of run around like a crazy person in the morning in order so that I could have lunch with her and she was like, well done Daisy, like you had a baked potato and I'd be like, yeah, but I also ran a marathon this morning, <laughs> so it didn't really work. <laughs> and then I, um, I was also working kind of, uh, I was working at a garden centre and uh, it was just an excuse for me to exercise and I kind of took over my life, I'd take on so many extra hours, I hated my job, it was the worst job I've ever had. Uh, the people were lovely though, and uh, I just, I ran myself into the ground basically, I, I couldn't cope anymore again, and ended up in hospital again, so I had another admission, my first admission by the way was four months and a bit, and this the second admission, I was completely mental, and I, I'm embarrassed at some of the things that I used to do in hospital, and um, my parents said that when I actually got admitted, they were like, okay, whew, we don't have to deal with you anymore. And that then when they actually started to come to see me, because they had to wait a bit because I was so crazy, uh, they came to see me and my dad said that I looked worse. I was getting worse being in the hospital because nothing was happening. I was so malnourished that all I could think about was how could I run around my room that was kind of like this big to burn off that one pea that I ate. Um, <coughs> you know, it was just, it was horrible. My whole life revolved around OCD and exercise and anxiety and, and, and metaphobia and I, I had so many routines that I just I couldn't even begin to think about getting rid of it and I I had I had resigned myself to a life of illness and I was kind of told that by professionals as well that mm, you're you're a chronic anorexic Daisy, you're never gonna get better, like your O C D is so bad, you're too severe for our doctors and um it it was disheartening and because I was in such a <coughs> low place, I would just I would believe them and I told my parents that this is it, this is my life now forever, I'm, I'm just going to be in and out of hospital for the rest of my life and I don't care. That didn't last, obviously, but I had more CBT, which was also useless. I had CRT as well, um, Cognitive Remediation Therapy. I've Actually, the hospital that I was at is where they made it up. Um, <laughs> it was it was interesting, but I, I found it fun, and I don't think therapy is supposed to be fun. I used to like the brain games, and because I was so competitive and such a perfectionist, I'd be like, right, well, I have to get 100% every single time. And um, I didn't really didn't I didn't see it as a therapy. I saw it as a game with myself, and how can I be the best at this therapy without it working? And uh, I, I could get around everything. I was kind of like, yeah, okay, I understand that I need a new neural pathway there, but like, I like my original one, so I'm going to keep it. And uh, it just made me better at um, faking, kind of getting better. Um, <laughs> I had another therapist as well. Uh, I also did DBT, group therapy, which was just shit, because I don't want everyone to know what I'm thinking. And uh, everyone just complains. And uh, so I had, I had a therapist that, well, my original therapist for my first admission, suddenly disappeared when I got to my second admission. I was like, okay. <laughs> and uh, this new therapist was quite newly qualified. Um, I hate to say, but I didn't like his shoes, so I knew I wasn't going to like him. <laughs> and, uh, he, I, I had my first session with him, and I was like, right, okay, like, it's going to work. I'm ready, I can do this. And then I was like, oh god, no, I can't. He didn't know what metaphobia was, didn't actually know what locus of control was, um, didn't know anything about kind of self-esteem affecting my anxiety. He, he was And uh, I used to dread going to my sessions and I'd pretend that I was ill so I couldn't go and I'd um, lock myself in my room and pretend that I was dead. And uh, <laughs> basically, I ended up getting accused of bullying him. Um, because I, <laughs> I, uh, I refused to go to my sessions and other people may have heard me saying that and uh, he, he got me in trouble and I had to go and see the manager of the ward and we had a meeting and she told me that I had to have therapy otherwise why was I there and I was like well you can discharge me I don't really care you're not helping me and uh, I, apparently I handled myself really well because I read the notes of the meeting that I wasn't supposed to and uh, it said that I, I was very assertive and I knew what I wanted and basically the doctor just couldn't handle me and 
that was it. Like I, d I just stopped having therapy. So I was in a hospital for a mental illness and I wasn't having any therapy at all. And I just, I was so angry. And I was on weekend leave once and I went, fuck it. I'm gonna write to Rob, I'm gonna do it. And I, well, it took me ages to write this really long email, kind of um, <laughs> begging for help. And being like, oh, I don't know what to do. Like, I wanna be better, but I'm stuck and my therapist is rubbish. <laughs> and uh, kind of groveling. And um, I didn't, didn't, didn't expect to hear back from it. So I kind of went back, I was still in hospital and my primary nurses, um, so if, if they watch this, cause I email them occasionally, being like, look how great I am. And uh, they were amazing. My primary nurses were brilliant. They, they never once gave up on me and they did help. They gave me specific OCD plans and stuff to reduce my exercise. And I, you know, I, I am very grateful <coughs> to them. They did help me a lot, but they weren't thrive. And so one day I was at home again and I got an email back from Rob. I was like, oh my God, he replied. Because they're like, he's kind of famous. <laughs> and, um, and I, I got it and, and I saw that it said, I'm not seeing clients at the moment. And I was like, no, I'm going to be ill forever. And then I had Karen on reading after I'd finished freaking out. And it said, but I'll, I'll forward your email to James. And I was like, well, that's not going to be as good as Rob. And, uh, and I also was thinking, that I said to my parents, I was like, I bet he's never going to email me. And James is never going to read my email. This is shit. Blah. My life is ruined. I'm always going to be like this. And then about two minutes later, I got an email from James. And I was like, oh, <laughs> whoops. And it was the loveliest email I've ever got. And it was, it was so kind of heartfelt. And just I felt for once, actually, this could be possible. And I, it was the first time I've also ever heard someone say full recovery, um, which is hilarious seeing as how many people I've seen about recovery, they've never said full recovery. And I read it and I thought, actually, this might work for me, what? And uh, it was just, it was nice. It was having someone say, no, this isn't, this isn't your lot. You can, you can do way better than this. And um, so I, booked my session and I went up to Cambridge on weekend leave secretly because I didn't want to tell the NHS that I was getting other treatment and uh, got my dad to drive me up to Cambridge from, um, where was I, Croydon <coughs> and um, went to meet James and I like, freaked out on the way and I was like, oh my god, I think I'm going to be sick, no I'm not, ah, ugh. I, got, uh, I had to have lunch as well when we were out and my dad was like, we need to buy lunch, I was like, but I don't know any of the places in Cambridge and they might make me ill, ah. and um, I just, I was like, oh god, I can't do this anymore. So we went to see James, I met James, and I, um, I had a really good kind of intro session, and I was like, right, Daisy, you're gonna like throw, throw yourself into this, you're gonna do it, you're gonna, you're gonna love it. And um, I went every, every week, I think for six weeks, yeah, I think it was, so. and every single week something was <coughs> different with me, something was better, and I, even though if I could, I could have a bad week, and instead of what I would previously do was I'd have a bad week, and then I'd have another bad week, and another one, because I'd be thinking about all the bad weeks I've had previously, and what would happen is that I'd actually, I'd have a few kind of slip ups in the week, and then when James would ask me how my week was going, I'd be like, mm, it's okay, it's like, it's not awful, and I would, and then I'd be like, actually no, I had a good week, like I did this, 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 and I could list all these positive things where previously I never would have been able to do that. I only would have told you about the bad things. And even the bad things, like, they, they weren't at the forefront of my mind anymore because suddenly I was having to look at my positive, oh yeah, can you see my, my orange dot on everything I own? It's so annoying. <laughs> and uh, my family hate me because they're all over the house. And um, so I was, I was being a lot more positive. And uh, what I found helpful about Thrive was that the... The tests were almost tangible, like I could see something go down every single week. I could cross something off the locus of control test every single week. And I felt um, like empowered by it because normally with therapy it's like, look how shit you are, like you, you're so bad, like look at all these bad things you do. Whereas with Thrive it's like, well hey, another one off, next thing, let's go, keep going. And also because it was so dynamic, I couldn't get bored and I couldn't get around something and it, it was just, it would keep me engaged the whole time. I was ever once thinking in my sessions, I'm so bored, like I really want this to over. I, my sessions were finished, I'd be like, wait, what? And I swear I only got here like two minutes ago. I don't really know if I should have enjoyed it so much. I feel a bit weird, like, <laughs> <laughs> like oh yeah, this is great. Um, and also what I also found incredibly helpful was that everything was backed up with science. And uh, one of my primary nurses once helped me by I had to do some 
I did some pretty grim exposure therapy in hospital, and one of them involved kind of rubbing my hands all over the bathroom, in the toilets, and like around the floor, rolling on the floor. That's one. Um, <laughs> My therapist rolled on the floor in front of me and I was like, no, so just kind of walked off. <laughs> Whatever, exposure therapy, <laughs> what a joke. Um, I, yeah, so I was, I was doing this exposure thing and I was freaking out and my, my, my nurse was like, what, what do they say in Thrive? You know, you, 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 you're not going to believe your thoughts anymore, your thoughts aren't real. And we came up with this kind of mantra thing, which was, um, I believe in fact, not fiction. And that's become a really helpful kind of thing for me now. And also because I, I like science, I like proof. Uh, perfectionist, uh, obsessive. Um, I uh, I liked being able to read the the articles that had been kind of noted in the book, and I I I liked having proof. And other therapy didn't have proof. It had the whole like uh, some people it kind of works for, and they get you know moderate success. And um, whereas Thrive was like everyone does great, and like everyone's brilliant. Ball. And I I just kind of got like caught up in it. I also, funny story, I used to have to tell people that I wasn't joining a cult. <laughs> I don't know what to think about that. Um, I also found the dream technique one of the most amazing things in, that's ever happened to me because um, I'm a bit of a, I don't know, dramatist. You don't say it. <laughs> <laughs> I swear I'm not warming like this. Um, and uh, my parents and, and Claire actually, I just got back from a holiday with Claire, which I'd never thought I'd go on. I went to Sardinia and I ate anything that was thrown at me and it was grand and I had a great time. And I went on the plane for the first time in a bazillion years. And anyway, when I was there, I had a few blips and um, I told Claire, I was like, Claire, I'm, I'm going to do the dream technique, I'm going to do it. And so I, I, am, I am incredibly over-animated when I do it, because otherwise I won't take it seriously. I have to really throw myself into it. And my parents know my, like, escape kind of position now. And so I kind of stick my hands in the air and I do this, because it's the only thing that I can do and keep talking. And I say it out loud. And I, I get really, like, like, G'd up about it. I'm like, Daisy, yeah, you're great. Like, you're amazing. I'm so proud of you. Well done. Like, this is so good. And uh, it does really help. My anxiety just goes down because normally everyone's taking the piss out of me when I'm doing it and um, <laughs> making it funny made it easier I do it's kind of self deprecating whatever um, and also another thing about Thrive um, was looking at language I'd never thought about how my spoken language uh, affected my mental health and I think you could probably tell I still use quite catastrophic language I, I use big emotional words um, and my parents now try and like slap me out of it when I say grim or disgusting or gross because gross is like my favourite word. But now I can kind of I can say it and be like, wait, it's not gross, it's unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm still I'm still working on stuff. I'm, I still feel like a newbie here. And um, next page. Um, oh yeah, um, I was going to say as well. Thrive is not stupid. It's not for stupid people. And I liked that I was told that I was intelligent because it kind of made me go, oh yeah, Daisy, you are actually intelligent. You've done quite, you know, you've done quite a few things in your life. Well done. And um, I liked that it, it was kind of it. It always built you up. It didn't push you back down again. There was nothing angry about it. There was no blame put on you in Thrive. It was all there's. No, it's not your fault. It's not your mum's fault. It's not your dad's fault. And I think that was really good because I also. Excuse me. My parents have been threatened by social services um, quite a few times because apparently they were abusing me because they were being emotionally abusive. But that was because my therapy was telling them that I was a bad child, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> so they liked that no one was being blamed because they were going, whew, there's no social services involved. <laughs> um, I also found the significant other thing very helpful. And, and what's different about me is that my dad is my significant other. My, he, he is the one, he, listen, dad. Um, I'm trying to make him do Thrive, but he will not do it. And he had, he's had his own mental health problems, but he, um, and he had a breakdown when I was very young. And uh, he, he is my one colluder. He will let me get away with things. And uh, since doing Thrive, I have now become the most horrible daughter to my dad. So I'm like, Dad, no, don't do that. That's bad. You're, you're, you're making me worse. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to like guilt trip him into doing it, but it's, it's not worked yet. So I'm hoping that now I've exposed him here, he, he'll be like, oh shit, I'm gonna change my life a little bit. But um, yeah, I, I wanted to say that I, I don't think it would have worked for me if I hadn't have 
thrown myself into it the way I did. Because if I had started doing it maybe three weeks before I went to James, I still would have been like, no, but I'm still going to go running this afternoon because like I love running. But actually, I, I, when I started out, I was like, wait, no, Daisy, you have a 20 minute pass to walk slowly. You're not going to abuse it because every time you do something that is your, your eating disorder or your phobia is telling you, you're making it stronger. I'm giving the strength away from myself. I'm giving <coughs> it to something else to make my life shitter. So what I wanted to do was take everything back and be like, no, I want the power. I've, I've got the power to be better than this. And... Um, I found that really did helpful in life. I proved to myself only ever gets better once you start working on it, and once you stop life happening to you and you start, you know, giving to life, it's way better. Um, but now i you know, I'm thriving now, but I'm, I'm still seeing the um, Sedcast people because they are monitoring me to get to a healthy weight for the first time <coughs> in my life, which is terrifying. But I am actually looking forward to it. Me and Claire are both talking about how we're excited now about becoming healthy and being able to do things for fun rather than because of it's fueled by an eating disorder. So I'm glad for them because they help me move forward and they actually really like Thrive. My nurse thinks it's brilliant and every time she sees my phone, because I, I have a little orange sticker, she's like, guys, positive thought, come on. And I'm like, oh, God, I wish I'd never told you this. And she, she's really good, my nurse, and I'm actually due to be discharged probably in September um, because I'm going to university two years late. But um, I, I got in somehow, um, I got some A-levels and um, I'm going to a holiday to study music. Um, I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> working um, and I'm actually working for the fun of it and hilariously my job literally involves me shoveling horse poo all day um, so I am covered in mud, dirt, gross things and uh, not gross sorry <laughs> <laughs> unpleasantness and uh, I, I love my job I'm a groom for a carriage horse company and I, I do competitions with them and I get to wear a top hat and tail <laughs> great and, uh, oh, I look a bit like a boy though <laughs> too much hair has to go in the top hat and uh, I, I never would have thought that I would have been able to work in such a dirty environment and also my boss will come down and be like Daisy I've got some cookies here eat them but don't wash your hands first and I, I, I'll be like oh god uh, okay and so I kind of have this ability because they also they didn't know that I was crazy when I started and uh, it's kind of come out now because they know that I'm here today because I actually have a show tomorrow that I need to go to and uh, they they kind of it was nice being normal around them to start with, but now they know I'm nuts, I can kind of joke about it a bit more. <laughs> so that's my work, I love it. Um, and uh, I'm a bit more personal now. Um, I'm actually able to have relationships with people. Yeah. Not only friends, but I've actually recently, I, um, the first date I went on with my now girlfriend um, <laughs> was in a bit of a gross looking cafe and all the food was like out in the open and they, they didn't have a measuring thing, they just kind of did it and uh, I was like, do you want to ask how long that cake's been out and like if anyone's licked it or whatever and, and it was all mishmashed uh, old cutlery and stuff and it had cracks in it and I was like, oh my god, I bet there's loads of germs in there, ah. but then because I wanted to be cool in front of this girl, I was like, yeah, yeah, it's fine, I'll get like a huge piece of cake and then actually <laughs> when I did it, I was like, actually this is great, like I'm having a marvellous time and I'm coming across so well, <laughs> so normal. I mean, now she knows I'm like bananas, but <laughs> She's still with me. Um, I think I mentioned as well, I've been on holiday, which has been marvellous. I had, yeah, as I said, I had a few blips, and I'm not saying now that I'm 100% cured, because I don't believe in perfectionism anymore. Um, I, I would say I bounce around between 85 and 95% to where I want to be. And um, on my days when I'm at 85%, I'm like, Mom, my life is over. And I'm like, wait, hang on, days. No, it's not. <laughs> You're not in the hospital, you're having lunch, and you're going to go out again later, and like you're not going to think about this. My blips don't last very long, I don't let them affect me anymore. My blips are not a, such a negative impact, it's more just kind of, it's more of a time for me to see how far I've come instead of what I've done wrong. And it's kind of like, okay, well, I'm going to refocus, I'm going to get back into this game, my perspective, and come back to, come back to thrive. And uh, I, I must say that it has completely changed my life and um, I before Thrive I would have been described as a boring 
boring person and, and people pitied me and felt sorry for me because I couldn't do anything and uh, now I say I'm such a risk taker now which my driving teacher hates <laughs> <laughs> he, he said to me he was like yeah young people these days are so risky and I was like oh my god someone called me risky like, ah, that's normal and, uh, so that, that's you know I don't know if that's a good thing or not whether my driving teacher is concerned about me driving but, um, I, I, I can actually live life now and um, without drive I'd still probably be in hospital running around my room cleaning my cutlery trying to like scrub myself in bleach and um, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't have stayed in some shitty hotel um, down the road and got lost a million times. And I wouldn't have eaten at a service station. And I wouldn't have. I wouldn't be here talking without like shaking. Even though I've always been kind of fond of talking about myself, if you can tell. Uh, even though I had such low self-esteem, I thought no one cared. I'd be like, but still, I'll tell you my life story, just so you can feel sorry for. Um, so I have, I have chosen life now because of Thrive and um, I, I know what I want and I'm in control of it now and um, I, can, I can see my thoughts, I can hear my thoughts and be like, man bollocks, that's limiting, like, I'm not, I, don't, I don't want to be in this limiting place anymore, I, I want to be in, in this open zone mm -hmm. and um, I just want to keep going. So like I'm still I'm still on my journey. James James drew me a, a thing of a, a trip to Cambridge to my house and being like you, you're still on the, the M11 and the M25 and all the other ones in between, but you, you're not quite there yet. But it doesn't matter. Just it doesn't matter how long it takes either. It just matters that I'm always moving forward. And it doesn't matter if I take a trip off to a service station briefly and freak out. As long as I come back and I'm going the right way, I don't care. My life is so great now. This is so vain. But um, I, I love it and I'm, I can't thank Thrive enough. And I feel like I've talked quite a lot because my mouth is really dry. <laughs> so I have no idea what else I've been saying. I've kind of just blitzed through it. But thank you very much for having me. I really